Dr. Hackey Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains. And today is a big thrill for me because we're interviewing Ken Dykewald, who's like the world's authority on something we all do, which is we all get older. It's about aging. And he started Age Wave, and he's been to the White House. He's made documentaries. He's written books you want to know about age and aging, which we all do? You ask this guy, who I know from about 53 years ago, but we'll get into that. Ken Dykewald, welcome to Exploring Different Brains. Great to be with you, Hacky. Now, why don't you introduce yourself properly? Because I probably butchered it quite a bit. No, you did a great job. I'm, uh, I was born in 1950. I grew up in Newark, New Jersey, not too far from where you grew up. It is true, you and I went to summer camp together when we were 15, I think we played on the same basketball team. Um, I initially went to school to be a physicist, but it was the late 60s and found myself more interested in the human potential movement and ultimately got my doctorate on the psychology of the body. But then in 1974, I was asked to head up the first preventative health research project for older people in North America. And so the idea was to see what effect things like yoga and tai chi and biofeedback and sensitivity training would have on people in their 70s and 80s and 90s. And the, and the truth of it is, is that I became absolutely captivated by older people in the aging process. And over the past 40, almost five years now, I've been kind of neck deep in that field trying to figure out um, what are the ways to grow old, healthy, and vital, and purposefully? And also, what happens to our country and to the world is more and more of people like us live longer and longer lives. And with declining birth rates, what happens when the whole world kind of tips the gravitational focus from young to old? And so that's been the focus of my work. And um, as you were kind enough to mention, I've given talks to about two and a half million people. I've met five presidents now, I've written 16 books, finishing a 17th, and tried my hand at filmmaking, and uh, still trying to figure it all out. Oh, by the way, and along the way, here's the craziest thing, along the way I got older myself. Wasn't expecting that, I don't know how you feel about that. <laughs> well, one of us in this interview has hair, what? and the other one looks like Shrek, so we'll let the audience decide. We just figured out we were born the same year, like a month apart, you know, a few days apart, yeah. so... Uh, yeah, but I haven't seen you in so long, and frankly, getting set to do this visit today, I thought, wow, look what you've done, man. New England Golden Gloves champ while in medical school, turned down a lucrative boxing offer as a young man, you know, became an orthopedic legend, became interested in the mind, you know, charitable philanthropist, went back in the ring in your 60s, I'm thinking, wow, congratulations to you, my friend. Boy, you're a good PR agent. No, congratulations now, to you. You, be, you're, well, thank you. What a life! Much. What a life you're living. You obviously have stayed very youthful. Okay, um, what's the single biggest thing when you speak and you talk to people that you emphasize the most? You know, I wish. Um, I know we're living in this era where there's supposed to be one answer, one thing, one single something. Um, honest truth is I think there's a few things that really matter the most. We've done research now all over the world with uh, long-lived people and we've asked them what's the most important ingredient and you think they're gonna say exercise or sleep or fitness or nutrition. It's not what they say. They say it's having people to love and being loved in exchange. That it's relationships is the single most important ingredient in a healthy longevity. So let me start with that. Um, second, I'd say that uh, really taking good care of your equipment, you know, we, um, it's not just you wake up at 76 and decide to go to the gym. It's the body is a complicated piece of work and doing as good as you can. Not everybody can, my wife works out a couple hours a day. I don't, um, you know, but making sure to keep your muscle tone making sure to breathe deeply, making sure you keep your flexibility, making sure you stimulate and activate the mind. Um, really taking care of this body that we're given, really important. And third, I would have to say uh, purpose. Uh, I particularly come to appreciate this as I rounded my 60th birthday eight years ago, that people who have 
who get up in the morning and there's something they want to do or there's something they want to be, uh, have more spring in their step, more twinkle in their eye, uh, even if they're in a wheelchair. They just have more going on than people who just kind of give it up and move to the sidelines. So I think uh, purpose is a critical ingredient in, in aging well. You know, uh, one of our board members for Different Brains, Lynn Wines, who's a fantastic individual, and has been CEO of a couple of banks and is on the bank board for Bank United. She went back to uh, Harvard to do a fellowship in advanced leadership. And, uh, and, uh, and now she's finishing a master's in public uh, uh, you know, administration and, and policy and so forth at NYU. And um, she was just featured in Humans of New York. And um, she quoted you, I think, in the Thank sense you. that without giving you credit mm -hmm. for it, but she told me it was from somebody she knew about through Harvard Business School or Harvard up there somewhere. And it was, she used the words that I've seen you use when I was reading about you, going from success to significance. Elaborate on that a bit. Yeah. Um, first, let me tell you where that thing popped up in my head or in my life, and then I'll comment on the program at Harvard because I think it's a good model for what you're going to see more of. So I don't know how many years ago it was. I was about to launch my something, 12th book or something, a book called The Power Years. And when you launch a book, as you know, you get all excited because you can hopefully get on talk shows and the morning shows and maybe get some media coverage. And Instead, what happened is there was a big, uh, there was a big storm in the Katrina hit in New Orleans. And so basically all book launches were just put to the sidelines. So I had all these weeks and I basically stayed home and with my kids and we watched Katrina. And I thought, wow, I mean, this is a terrible thing happening. And these people are not being helped and homes are ruined and people are dying and it was just horrible and I was very we were all very thrown by the idea that um, we could be so callous as a country and not be right there loving and helping these people so I decided that I was going to take all the earnings from that book and donate them to Habitat for Humanity for the rebuild of New Orleans now I didn't know if that would be a little bit of money or a lot of money but I just thought you know what the last chapter in that book was called Leaving a Legacy, and I thought, how can I look myself in the mirror or expect my kids to respect me if I don't live what I say? So I called Jonathan Reckford, who is the director of Habitat for Humanity, and I knew Jonathan because I had built houses with President Carter. And I said, Jonathan, just so you know, I want to uh, make this pledge, and I, I think that we're going to have a lot of work in New Orleans getting those people back on footing. And he said to me, Ken, he says, you know, uh, I know what you're going through now. There's a lot of people your age going through it. Now, that's supposed to be my specialty. So I said to him, what are you talking about? He says, you know, you got that gnawing feeling. And I said, what gnawing feeling? And he said, you know, you're trying to make the transition from success to significance. So it wasn't a phrase that I cooked up. He laid it on me. And when he said it, I thought, yeah, you know, I've... I've had a pretty good life, you know, I mean, not everything has worked out, but you reach a point in your life where you want to give back, you want to contribute. You know, I'll tell you, there's a guy, David Brooks, he's a writer, he's a conservative writer for the New York Times, he's on, N he's on PBS and NPR a lot. David wrote a piece about a year ago talking about your two resumes. And by the way, normally when people want to talk about aging, they just want to talk about fitness and exercise, and I know we'll get there. but. But he wrote about your two resumes. One resume is your career resume. What you did, how much money you made, whether you were a vice president or you were a director or whatever. And the other is your eulogy resume, he said. And the eulogy resume is far more important. That's what people are gonna say about what kind of person you are. That's gonna be a short description of the life you lived. And this success to significance thing, I think there's more and more people when they think of aging, rather than thinking about it as a time of decline and loss and failure and going to the, you know, going to the trash heap, 
I think there's a whole lot of us that are thinking, you know, maybe these could be in some ways the most potent years of our lives. You may not have the, you probably can't box like you did when you were 18, but you've probably got a lot more wisdom and compassion and perspective and connections. And you know what's important and less so. And so that success to significance, I'm honored that somebody would use that line because I wrote about it. But um, it was laid on me by Jonathan Reckford. And I'll add one other piece. So part of the problem is, is that we are living in an era, Hacky, where we always expected to live maybe 70 years or so. So most people, and keep in mind, throughout 99% of human history, the average life expectancy was under 18 at birth. And I'm not making that up. That's what's so. When we signed our Declaration of Independence, you know, the life expectancy in America was 35 on average. So there were very few 40 or 60 or 80 year olds. There were a few, but not a lot. Most people died young before they had got old enough to either have osteoarthritis or Alzheimer's or even to have wisdom. So we created an educational system that was designed to front load you. So you and I went to school, you went to college, you went to Boston University, I went to Lehigh to start. And the idea we thought then was we're gonna get trained and it'll last us for life. So back at college, you saw young people. You didn't see old people. And there was even this, this, you know, this lame comment, oh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Now we're finding, hey, if you're going to live 80 or 90 or 100 years, maybe you go back to school at 50. Maybe you learn how to play the guitar at 70. Maybe you ride in your first marathon when you're 90. Maybe you fall in love when you're 55. And so that idea is beginning to manifest in interesting ways. So maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, two wonderful people, David Gergen and Rosabeth Moss Cantor, both professors at the Kennedy School at Harvard, decided that they would do an experiment. And they created a program called the Center for Advanced Leadership. And the idea of this program at Harvard, which takes, I don't remember if it's a year or two, is that people who have been massively powerful and successful, who are retired, come back to college and they specifically learn how to change the world from a not-for-profit point of view. And that's the focus, not to make money and not to be a big shot, but what, what do you need to know in order to change the world? And so that program, the Center for Advanced Leadership, there's now a similar one at Stanford, but community colleges all over the country are beginning to create programs so that older adults can not only go back to school for their own enjoyment, but can learn how to hone their chops or learn new technology or learn how to volunteer with kids or learn how to teach young people things that they may have learned in their lives. So I'm a big fan of things like that. I think it's positive. I think it's very positive stuff. It's an excellent history. And, and you know, we're, as we evolve, we're coming to grips with all of this. I remember back when I, you know, when I was boxing, I turned pro at 38, and then I had a good string going, and then I was in my 40s, and George Vesey from the New York Times did like three feature articles. One of them we coined the, the word, well, I don't think we coined it, but it was ageism, how we described it. This is going back in the 90s, where we were really just starting to not discriminate as much against, quote, older people and everything. And now the whole paradigm's been shifted. And so when, when I graduated medical school at Boston University in 74, our commencement speaker was Isaac Asimov. Oh. <laughs> and, and Isaac Asimov said... That's uh, pretty cool. It was very cool. <laughs> and the two things I remember that he said was... I think he had those big mutton chop sideburns back in the day. He was very but, cool. Yeah. He was a cool guy. Great science and, fiction and, writer. And, and he said... And he was a great scientist and a great thinker. And the two things... Uh, that he said were, that I remember, was um, that when great discoveries are made, it's not somebody laboring intensely in a laboratory going, Eureka, I found it. It's somebody looking through a scope or something going, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what that is. Let's look into that. But the other thing that resonated that I kind of put together with the first thing was basically saying that we were not going to do what we should do, which is in 1974, you're not preparing 
for how society is going to change because everyone's going to be old. This was back in 74 as a society. And now it's 2018. It's however many years later, 40, 50 years, whatever it is. And I'm sitting here talking to Ken Dykewald, Mm -hmm. who is has been really a visionary in this and in getting it done and in getting it on our main menu. So let's go now from the individual, what the individual does to society in general. As far as the individual goes, there's a TED talk on the uh, study, I'm sure you're familiar with, the Harvard 75-year longitudinal study, which showed that, as you said, strong social relationships blow everything out of the water. And we're finding that very, very difficult now. So address this now with society as a whole, with the importance of strong relationships how you see how we're doing as a world now, and where we should be going. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to, I'm going to be honest with you since we're old camp buddies. Um, yeah, I'm not sure we're doing so well, to be honest with you. Uh, what I see is that we're segmenting ourselves out by generations. If you ask people who their best friends are and then ask them to tell you the age of their best friends, they're all going to be pretty close to their age. We don't have a lot of 30-year-olds hanging with 60-year-olds or 80-year-olds mentoring 27-year-olds. We, we need more of that. So, you know, I, I'm a believer that we're all better when the, sort of the fabric of the generations is woven together. Uh, a good buddy of mine just launched a book this week. It's called Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder. It's a guy named Chip Connolly who uh, w- created the Joie de Vrive hotel chain and then was brought in by these young tech guys to make sense of Airbnb and they turned it into the biggest hospitality brand in the world. And what he found was is that his maturity, he was only in his 50s, was like considered real like, you know, gray-haired stuff. And these young kids wanted it. They wanted to know what he had learned in his life, how he made decisions. And he wanted to learn from them about tech and how they thought. So, A, I think we're better when the generations are, are coming together. The other thing is that I think after World War II, I don't know when, where you grew up, but uh, in the neighborhood you grew up, but when I, until I was five, we lived in the same house with my grandparents. And up in the attic, there was a boarder. She was a woman, came in through the living room and went up to her room. And um, then this idea came along after World War II that the American dream meant that everybody should have their own house. Every child should have their own bedroom. Everybody should have their own car, and that's become even more extreme because now everybody's got their own entertainment device and their own Instagram account and their own, you know, friendship network. And so, in an odd way, we've separated people out. There's a lot more individualism going on in this country. And so, when I look at the aging population, right now, over the age of 75, half of our country who's in that age group lives alone. I don't know, you got a lot of older people who are really alone and they're disconnected and they don't have someone to care about or to care for and their kids may live a thousand miles away. Wouldn't we be better off if we maybe had more communes, you know, maybe if we could couple three people share a house together, if we had what's called the village approach, which is I knock on your door, I say, hey, if you ever want me to watch your dog or take you to the doctor, that's fine, you could babysit my kids, you know, trying to reweave the fabric uh, between people. And and the the last thing I'll say is that, um, and I don't don't mean this, I become a little more... uh, I'm looking at your gloves. I was just about to say I've been a little bit more willing to take the gloves off these last years in my own career because I feel a kind of a sense of urgency. You know, when you hit 68, I realize I may only have 50 more summers or I may only have one more summer. I don't know, you know. Um, But you start to think about the time you have. And um, I think a lot of people who are older complain that they're marginalized by society. But I think what's equally true is they marginalize themselves. You know, 
if you don't know how to use tech, if you don't understand why Kanye West is so fascinating to people, if you haven't watched This Is America and understand you know, what, what, uh, what he's trying to do, um, if you don't understand why young people are more comfortable with racial and ethnic and sexual diversity, you're, you're, you're packing yourself into the past. And so to remain current as an older person, you got work to do. You got to relate to young people. You got to listen to them. You can't always be judging them from your point of view and thinking that your, your life was the better one. Um, so there's a lot more of this weaving together that I think we'd all benefit from. And as you say, Hack, that uh, be good for us. It would stimulate our minds. It would give us a sense of what to do and how to dress and where to go and what to listen to. It would make us all be more alive if we had more of this multi-generational connection. And the last thing I'll say is that it's amazing that you heard a speech in 1974 where the word ageism was used because it's just been sort of coming around the bend these last few years. I'd like to say that we've gotten over ageism, but you know, I still see people making fun of older people a lot. I still see all the, you know, you look at American Idol and all the performers are usually under the age of 30. Well, how come there aren't any 70 or 80 year olds? Or, and then it's always, oh, we got the singing grandma. It's like, well, come on, just because she's an older woman doesn't mean she can't hammer it, you know? And uh, people still want to dye their hair to look young. And, you know, we got this whole fixation with young is better than old. And I am. Um, I'll give you one story from a wiser person than me. I, a few decades ago, when Betty Friedan came out with a book, The Fountain of uh, Age, she had written The Feminine Mystique in 1963. She was a tough gal. Betty and I spent a lot of time on the road doing speeches together. And one night I said to Betty, I said, uh, so when you wrote The Feminine Mystique, what were you thinking? And she said, I thought the time had come that women no longer be judged by the metric of men, how they could satisfy a man or how they could be as good as a man that era is over. It's time that women be judged by the metric of women. And maybe we should even start judging men by the metric of women to see if they're kind and thoughtful and caring enough. And so I said to her, what was the deal when you wrote The Fountain of Age? And she says, you know, we measure older people by the metric of youth. Are you as good looking as a young person? Can you move as fast as a young person? Are you as cool with tech as a young person? She said, maybe we should measure older people by the metric of wisdom and experience and perspective and wouldn't that be a good thing and so I still think we tilt a lot more in this country towards young is good old is not so good and with all due respect when you first started this interview you told me I was looking very youthful it's an interesting thing because if I saw you and seen you for a while and I said to you hacky man you're looking so young you'd probably say thank you but if I say, hack, man, boy, do you look old, you'd be insulted by that. Why? Because we think old is a put down. We think old is what you don't want to be. And so this ageism is so pernicious, we often don't even realize it when we're doing it. I think we need to come to sort of an age neutral world. We need to, we all need to come together more. And what are you interested in? How can I be of help to you? How can I understand you better? How can you know my mind? How can I know your mind? And how do we, by coming together, make a better mosaic of it? You know, that's a very, very, very interesting perspectives. And this comes at a time when all of our measurements are in evolution now. And on, superimposed on that, we have the breakdown of the original model you were talking about. The intergenerational model was when we had the great migrations and people came over and lived on the east side of New York and you had grandparents with grandchildren and everybody, cousins all around. And now I ah, just took a job in Minneapolis and right. you're all alone. And it's, it's tough. And I think that the um, isolation problem as we go on and mature is getting more and more difficult. And I think, I think it's a bad thing. I read a study recently, it's something like spending your time alone is like twice as negative an impact on your health as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. That there be, 
I was in London a couple of months ago and they now have a ministry of loneliness. Um, minister of loneliness because they feel like this lonely thing is becoming an epidemic. That people are so disconnected and we don't support each other enough and we're not aware of our neighbors. That, uh, you know, it's, but you know, history is about course correcting. I was in a, leading a focus group a few years ago and there was a guy in the group, it was an older guy that had been on the Apollo mission. You know, that amazing, you know, trip up into, into space and he explained that they had plotted that thing out for years before the missile went up, but 90% of the time it was off course. And so the whole exercise of the Apollo mission was continually course correcting. I think it's the same with our lives, you know. Just because you haven't exercised for 10 years doesn't mean you can't start walking again. Just because we've gotten a little too far apart as humans doesn't mean we can't come back together. So I think that this course correction model allows us to stop and think. I think it's partly why you're doing this program, Hack, because you want everybody to be thinking about having a little more regard for other folks who may be different than them. Ken, it's been so great to have you here. Um, please tell our audience how they find out more about you. Sure. My company's website is www.agewave, one word, agewave.com. And that's sort of a portal into all the things we're doing, all the media, all the projects we're working on. Easy to find. Ken, it's been a pleasure to have you here at Exploring Different Brains. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule, and thanks for everything you're doing. Haki, it's great to be with you. Great to see you again after all these years as well. Exploring Different Brains is a production of Different Brains, Inc. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.org.